For joining us now, professor at Harvard University, Pulitzer Prize winning author Annette Gordon Reed. She's back with her new book entitled On Juneteenth. Also with us is managing editor of The Atlantic, Jillian White. This month, <clears throat> the magazine is running another installment of its Inheritance series on black America and features a chapter from Annette's new book. It's good to have you both this morning. So, uh, so Annette, I um, want to bring up um, this debate that has been going on and, and get your thoughts on it. And also as it relates to your book and, mm -hmm. and our history and us coming to terms with our history. Uh, and that is the debate, the 1619 versus 1776 debate. I remember having you on for Tom uh, Ricks's book, and I asked oh, yes. you about Jefferson. How do we balance the fact that his words may have freed more people than anybody else, and yet he was, in, in many ways, a deplorable human being who saw uh, many of his slaves as little more than livestock? And you said we balance it. Explain. How do we balance that? Well, back to the question about 1619 and 1776 and Jefferson's involvement. Obviously, Jefferson comes into this because of, as the drafter of the American Declaration of Independence. Uh, but history is a combination of good and bad. And you have to think about the things that were useful uh, in the context of things that were not so useful, things that were deleterious to our development. 1619 and 1776, you framed it as a debate. I don't necessarily... I know there is a debate, because people can make a debate out of anything, but uh, both of them go together in my book. 1619 right. explains the kind of society we that we had in 1776. In the South, a slave society, and in the North, a society that had slaves. So it's... It's the beginning of, of a culture, but it wasn't the beginning of the American nation, which we like to think of as 1776. The Americans thought that the Declaration did that, created the United States of America. So here's what you write in the book about the importance of origin stories. Quote, origin stories matter for individuals, groups of people, and for nations. They inform our sense of self telling us what kind of people we believe we are, what kind of nation we believe we live in. They usually carry at least a hope that where we started might hold the key to where we are in the present. We can say then that much of the concern with origin stories is about our current needs and desires, usually to feel good about ourselves, not actual history. And I wonder, um, especially since this is sort of a big debate at a fever pitch right now, about the importance of teaching about our darker chapters. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to do both of those kinds of things. You have to mm -hmm. present a realistic picture of life because we know no human being, no country, nothing is all perfect. And if you're it's like children who think of their, their parents as perfect when they're little, and it's not until you get to be an adult uh, and sometimes have kids of your own, that you realize these are people who were struggling along, who may not have known what they were doing all the time. You love them nevertheless, but you get to see them as real human beings, who they actually were. And I think it's the same thing in the life of a country. It does no good to just pretend that this has all been sweetness and light and that there hasn't been, haven't been tremendously terrible things that have happened in the past. But as we were saying at the top, at the beginning of this, is that we have to find some way to balance that. And that's what life is about. So, so and that, why, why, why do you believe it is so difficult for us to engage in just basic dialectical thinking that two things can be true at one time. Why is it that uh, that so many run to their corners, not only on campus, but off campus, and you have to choose an either or? It's either 1776 or uh, those in that camp will say, or you have to choose 1619. This should not be difficult. Our origin story, as you say, is complicated, and it involves uh, not only those two dates, but many others that we haven't traditionally taught in American history. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's an eternal question, why the binary thinking? But that's, it's a fault. It's a difficulty because we live in a complicated society. The United States is a diverse, 
um, whether people like it or not, a multicultural society. Uh, we don't have, we're not supposed to be based upon a notion of blood. Uh, we are based upon an idea, an idea, that's what we like to say. And it's very hard for people, it seems, to come together uh, around this, these particular ideas and we fall back into our respective corners and fight, as you're suggesting. But the only thing we can do is to try to bring some, uh, some semblance of, of order, some semblance of empathy to the enterprise and hope that people realize that our, we have things more in common sometimes than we have that are things that divide us. Annette, it's Willie Geis. Great to have you back on the show this morning. It's Good interesting to listen to the conversation over what should be taught in school, which history should be taught. And as you're alluding to here, it can be both, though there are many people in what's become a cultural war who view this as a concession. If we allow 1619, then we're giving up our heritage. We're giving up, we're changing the American story. What would you say to those people? And what would you say to school districts around the country who are grappling with this right now? Well, I would say that you're learning American history. You're learning all aspects of American history. It's possible, as, as I said, to talk about 1619 as the beginning of enslavement in English colonies, but then realize that we come to 1776 and there's this announcement in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, and it creates a dilemma. The American dilemma begins with those words because we know that at the time there was chattel slavery, and what we've had since that time is to try to make those ideals real. So I think that there's a way to do this uh, without either oaring it or suggesting that you hide uh, things that were not, you know, that were not perfect. We're on a, I said yesterday, we're struggling. We're on a, we're on a road to some place. There's no perfection at this moment, but we're trying to, to get better and better. And that's what, I think that's what history teaches us. There's no end point that's going to be perfect, but it's the process, change over time. And you make decisions about how you want to change. And that's where we are at this particular moment. And Jillian, it's so great to have you on because uh, much to the point of what we're talking about this morning, um, the Atlantic has uh, the, the uh, Inheritance series. And of course, uh, Annette is a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. So the Inheritance series is a long running multi-year exploration into black history. Um, Annette's piece is such a core part of this chapter, chapter two, which launches today. Um, and it really focused on the idea of place. And so much of what Annette just said really resonates with why we chose that as the second chapter. Um, understanding where you came from, understanding uh, the stories that have been kept from you is such an important part of understanding who we are as a people, how we fit into this country, how we fit into the world. And keeping a people from their history is truly a form of oppression. And that is what we're trying to undo with this project. We are trying to solve the issue that so many people are having of growing up for however many years, thinking that they understand one form of American history, and now having a really hard time swallowing that they probably only got a really tiny percentage of that. And the truth of the Inheritance Project and the truth of America's history is that Black people and people of color have been there all along. Um, and there is no American history without fully understanding the good, the bad, and the ugly of the history of this country. And, you know, Annette is truly the expert at being able to surface those things in tandem. For sure, and I love that uh, morning sun uh, on Jillian <laughs> making the shot heavenly. Uh, in both the book and the article, uh, Annette, you make the point that even language uh, can, can be used to promote difference and prejudice. And you write in part, the fiction that has African-Americans naturally speaking in a particular way or are unable to learn a language slyly promotes the notion that blacks are somewhat less than human in their inability to master a human trait, the capacity to engage in complex communication. At the very least, the ideas about blacks and language serve as a means to convey the supposed gulf that exists between the races. Um, I'm wondering if you could expound upon that, uh, Annette, especially uh, given that there are words, you know, that we can't even say. There's language on both sides that are causing huge problems in our society today. 
Mm-hmm. Well, I'm talking in that section about the fact that black speech is always rendered uh, in a particular way. And the, the speech mm-hmm. of enslaved black people is rendered in a particular way. And the chapter that's excerpted in The Atlantic talks about Estebanico, who was a black Arab who, was, who came with Spanish explorers to the area that was Texas back in the 1500s. We're talking about 1619. Estebanico is in, in the Texas region in the 1520s. And he was the translator between the Spanish and the native peoples that they encountered. And that was because he had a, a talent for language. And I was just wondering in that um, excerpt about my childhood, when I learned about enslaved people, what a difference it would have made to think about Estebanico's story, that he was there in Texas and he was relied upon as a translator because he had a talent for languages versus the idea that a black incapacity, inability to deal with language. And thinking about Sojourner Truth, who was Dutch, who was born uh, in upstate New York and spoke Dutch first. And yet when they produce her language, it's in the same kind of dialect that they do for every enslaved African-American. And that idea is, I think it puts some sort of notion of distance between blacks and whites. And something so simple as language can be used to promote an idea of inferiority and incapacity. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.